Welcome to Adventure Thinking, an intimate series of live video podcasts that explores the mindset born from challenge, adversity, and living a life of no regrets. I'm Jonesy, your host, and for the past 20 years, I have been lucky to have embarked on some crazy expeditions and returned transformed with some pretty epic tales to share. Each week, I'll be bringing adventure stories and mindsets down from the proverbial mountaintop as we dive into the hearts and minds of some of the world's greatest adventurers. These are people that have achieved truly phenomenal undertakings against all odds and have returned better for it. So, do you want to live more adventurously? This is Adventure Thinking. Oh, geez, and you can still film in the background. <laughs> it's that I feel like I'm in an elevator. Oh, geez, it feels like that. Lauren, how are we today? Uh, good. We are currently, you might see the backgrounds a little bit different. We are hiding in a garage from our children because we learned last week that it was very distracting for me to be able to hope that a child naps during a podcast, which never seems to happen. So thankfully, it takes a village to raise a child. And Justin and I have um, Oma and Opa um, watching both kids. So we're hiding in their garage. I'd say it's beyond distracting. I mean, I don't think you're able to do anything. <laughs> well, I had to leave. You had to leave straight away. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway, sleeping naps and all that. But, to but that- we're so excited for this conversation. We just had a pre-conversation in the car with the amazing James Edward Mills, and um, there was so much good stuff, we had to put a pin in it, and I hope that we can get back to that level, because he is one fantastic human with um, some really amazing stories to share. I I actually first met James back in 2012 at the Banff Mountain Film Festival. He introduced me, uh, well, actually, introduced me, he didn't introduce me, he interviewed me, I should say, about Crossing the Ice, which was the documentary made on uh, the Antarctic journey that Cass and I did. And I, I, to tell the truth, I mean, that trip was a bit of a blurb for me. I mean, there was a lot of jet lag and a lot of beers. And I think, I'm not sure. But the trip in Antarctica or the trip to Banff? The trip to Banff. <laughs> but, so I, I hope I came across pretty well, but he's agreed to be on this. So I kind of been a complete goose. Well, and we just watched last night, Justin and I had a date night on, in our living room on the floor and watched um, his... That sounds really wrong, Lauren, on the floor, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, we were sitting on the floor okay. and had... We watched The American Ascent, um, the documentary that James co-produced and narrated, I believe. No, no. I mean, not narrated, directed. He co-produced and wrote. Co-produced and, and co-wrote. wrote. Thank you. Um, um, it is. It literally gave me goosebumps. I absolutely loved it. And I have to say, after watching it, and I won't give too much of the film away, but it's about a group of... American climbers who um, were doing climbing Denali and I was so taken by the story and I could see myself in it that I would said to Justin something I probably will regret but is I actually really want to climb Denali and he was like really it's locked in and I was like let's not take it that far yet but it was a fantastic film and we're going to jump in and have a chat with James. We are. Just, just to give a little bit of background yeah. to him, uh, James Edward Mills is a freelance journalist and an independent media producer. And he's had a career spanning well, 20 years in counting in that field and specializing in stories about outdoor recreation, environmental conservation, acts of charitable giving, and uh, basically sustainable living. So the stuff that Lauren and I are both super passionate about. He's like... If two of us could combine to one superhuman, that would probably be James. <laughs> he is pretty handy with the written word. Uh, and not only that, but he's worked in the outdoor industry since 1989 as a guide, outfitter, independent sales representative, writer and photographer. And he's done a huge bunch of stuff in the mountaineering, rock climbing. We're actually just talking about fishing yesterday, fly fishing. I'm going to have to go to Wisconsin, Laurie, to go fishing with him. And apart from uh, from that, you know, writing for the biggest newspapers and publications in the US, he curates and writes his own blog and podcast called The Joy Chip Project. And, and he's also a lecturer at Wisconsin University. Does so many I feel so <laughs> lazy, actually. Now, James is passionate about bridging the adventure gap. That's what he's speaking about today. The unequal use and recreation of wild places by, by people of color, basically. Minority populations are much less likely to seek recreation, adventure, and solace in in our wilderness spaces. 
And with minority populations expecting to become the majority in the US over the next 20 years, the lack of connection with these wild places is set to become a pretty big issue. I mean, it already is. Now, he's written a book about this issue called The Adventure Gap, which has been, I think, just recently listed as one of the 10 most influential books of this decade, which is phenomenal. And he has co-produced and written a movie called An American Ascent, which highlights that issue by chronicling the first African-American expedition to tackle North America's highest peak, Denali. Now, we will kick off this podcast with a trailer from that movie. I grew up with people telling me what I couldn't do. You can't because of your color. There's never been a group of black climbers coming together in an expedition to get to the summit of Denali. I think if I do it, hopefully that'll inspire other people to do it as well. It was rough, man, just tackling the head wall with really, really heavy packs. It's almost like the mountain dares you to make a mistake. It's totally destroyed right now. It's going to be hard, and you know it. It's pretty clear that from here on, it's the real deal. We're so exposed, just got to be ready for anything. Not optimal. I've seen one fall on the slope already. James, welcome to the show. Hi, James. Joe. Hey, how are you? It's it's good to be with you, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. No, super cool. It's good to actually see you. It's been it's been a long time. I think we caught up also in twenty thirteen in Banff, so seven years. Yeah, yeah, but yeah it's been a while. It has been a long, long while, but we've made plans now. So we're going to catch up in Wisconsin and go fishing, aren't we? And we're going to come to Australia as well. That's the plan. I hope so. No, for sure. And um, if you guys ever make it to Seattle, at the very least, we can hang out there as well. So um, I hope that, that we can get together sometime in the United States. So or in Australia. Either way, I'd love to see it. Would love it. I actually haven't done a ton of climbing in the U.S. or mountaineering because that wasn't something that was kind of on my radar as a kid. And what we were talking about earlier, I didn't really see myself, um, I guess, in that industry. So now that I feel like that's changed a little bit, um, I would love to experience some of the climbs in the U.S. Also, as I said in the intro, your film made me want to climb Denali. So... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we can inspire you to do that. I personally um, haven't climbed it myself, so maybe we can do it together. Soon. Ooh! Hey, that's let's it. Do, let's, right. Okay, I'd lock that in. Let's. I would. I would love. Let's put that on the vision list and commit. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For well, sure. I will mention. Just watch out for kicking that mic because okay. it's, it's very sensitive. Sorry. Um, all good. But that's that's the nature of it. Now, thank you for taking the time to uh, to jump in. Now, the, the format of this this show, as we've been talking about, is we're going to take you, uh, or we want you to take us, I suppose, on a bit of a a bit of a, an adventure on a story and share a bit of a theme. And so, um, so I think because James, you had wanted to talk about the theme, the gap, or specifically the adventure gap. Um, could you share a story about a time that that gap was either wide or narrow for you um, within your experience in the outdoors or within your life in general? Well, I mean, the, the story that typically comes to mind, and it's um, almost always the story that I start my lectures with, and it begins with um, being in the Grand Canyon in 2016. And I don't know if you know anything at all about um, paddling um, the river from, the Colorado River from the... Um, I mean, from basically from one end to the other, it's a distance of 226 miles that you do over the course of 14 days. But in order to do that, you have to have a permit. And, and, a, and the permitting process in the United States is really complicated. And a buddy of mine had um, been interested in doing the Grand Canyon, and he has been putting his name in for the permit lottery for as long as I've known him. And I've known him for almost 20 years. And over that time, he always said that if 
the lottery came up, he would invite me on a trip. And in 2016, his number came up. He invited me to, to go with him on, um, on a trip down the Grand Canyon. I'm thinking, awesome. So we basically take two weeks, take up time off from work. We make our way to um, uh, Page, um, Page um, uh, Arizona, and we find ourselves at the push-in point for the, uh, for the Grand Canyon. And we're completely cut off from all civilization for an entire two-week period. And about halfway through the trip, my friend, his name is Jim Moss. Um, he's been a rafting guide on the Colorado River for many, many years. He's done dozens of trips on the Colorado River. This is one of you know many private trips that he had taken. And he looks over to me and says, you know, James, I've been paddling on this river for you know almost my entire adult life but you're the very first african-american i've ever guided and it really kind of took me aback that he actually had spent that much time on the river and he had actually never guided a black person before and what and year was this that's especially i'm sorry what year was this did you say <clears throat> uh, this, this is in 2016 yeah you know, so this is four years ago Recent. Yeah. and so no no it's, you know very recent, relatively recent, because, you know, the interesting thing about the, the Grand Canyon is that over 4.5 million people will visit the Canyon Rim every year, but only 29,000 people will actually make the trip from one end of the Grand Canyon to the other. And very few of those people relative to the overall population are people of color. You know, and a lot of it has to do with the lottery system because it's really hard to get on to a trip. The other thing is that, you know, if you've got the money, you can make a trip down the Grand Canyon. All you got to do is fork, fork over between five and $8,000 per person in order to make that kind of trip. Yeah. And so there's actually kind of a disparity between who can make this trip and who can't. And if you take a look at the Grand Canyon, it is indeed a divide between um, two large land masses. And it was, to me, an absolutely perfect illustration of what I ultimately described it as the adventure gap. I mean, that clear divide between who can spend time in the outdoors and who can't. And what's remarkable is that two years later, um, I just happened to get another trip to go with a completely different group of friends down the Grand Canyon. And this time I was personally really interested to see how many people of color that I might encounter along the way. And just like my friend Jim's experience, my own experience in 2016, here again in 2018, I'm the only African American or the only person of color that I saw on the Grand Canyon for an entire two week period. And to me, that really kind of illustrated how there is indeed this divide between those who spend time in nature and those who don't, those who have, you know, transformative adventures in the outdoors and, and very high profile adventures and those who don't. Um, disproportionately in the United States, most often um, people of color are disproportionately underrepresented when it comes to who has these experiences and who doesn't. And I'm really hoping that as we kind of expand our conversation around you know, what the adventure gap means and how to uh, shrink it or perhaps even close it, a lot of it has to do with making sure that we work really hard at defining the the various obstacles, you know, whether it's, it's uh, disposable income, whether it's access to leisure time, whether it is having a, a friend or a relative or a neighbor who's enthusiastic enough about the activity so that they're prepared to maybe help you learn. You know, can we figure out ways that we can get people to, to realize that these, especially these well as any places that are national parks are worth protecting. And so it's a big part of what I do, both as a journalist and um, also as, you know, frankly, what I like to describe as an amateur professional. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I guess the being American, um, I'm sitting and just being human at this day and age with what's going on in the world. Um, I'm sitting with a deep sadness, I guess, about that we're still here, you know, like, I guess naively, there was an element of me in Seattle when I grew up. Um, you know, I went to a public high school that had 40% um, uh, African American, about 20% Chinese. Um, it just, it, it, and it wasn't, 
a massive issue, I guess, for me, which I'm, I recognize that that's the problem. Um, but I knew I didn't feel racist. I didn't feel like I grew up in a racist environment. And I had kind of a, a lot of the, the story that I had been told is that I know that significant um, element of the past and I didn't see it. I guess I am saddened that it still is our present and I would hope that it won't be our future. And with everything that's happening in, in America, I'm looking at it through the lens of, you know, I didn't think that I, I personally was racist. I still, I, I need to be conscious about my actions and my thoughts and the systems I grew up, but the system still is not geared towards inclusiveness. Um, and I think we're seeing that quite um, specifically around the world with all the riots that are going on. Um, so you talk a little bit, bit about that gap existing and closing the gap. I mean, where, where where do you think we need to put our attention most right now? What do we need to be hearing and, and knowing? More well, I think more than anything else, I think it's really important that we look in the past. You know, we take a look to see how it is that we got to where we are today. And I think that a lot of people automatically assume that that because they haven't heard stories about people of color in the outdoors, that there were no people of color in the outdoors. And even myself, having grown up in California, having um, spent many summers and and spring break vacations going to Yosemite and to the Grand Canyon and to Yellowstone, I mean, I never heard these stories. And, and this is coming from a very affluent African-American family in Los Angeles. But these were part of our, of our history. Fast forward to uh, 2009, I'm a, um, a journalist, I've been devoting some time to telling the stories of diversity, equity, inclusion in the outdoors, and I had a chance to interview you know, the illustrious documentary filmmaker Ken Burns. And Ken Burns um, and Dayton Duncan had just produced the film The National Parks of America's Best Idea. And I asked him in an interview for my podcast, so what are you going to do to do a better job of telling the stories of people of color? And Burns then proceeds to tell me about how he's going to tell the stories of people of color. And, and, and did I know about the Buffalo Soldiers, African-American members of the U.S. Cavalry, who between 1903 and 1906 protected and preserved Sequoia and Yosemite National Parks? You know, so at the turn of the century, there was 400 African-American men working as essentially national park rangers. They built roads, they established campgrounds, they did many of the things that national park rangers do today, you know, right up to and including building the road that leads to Mount Whitney at the time was the highest point in the United States. You know, and I'm literally sitting there with my mouth at the gate going, Black people helped to create Yosemite. I had no idea. Hmm. And that was pretty much a radicalizing experience for me because if I had, at the time, a 20 year career in the outdoor industry and I had never heard that story before, that means that millions of people haven't heard that story before. And if we can find these stories and start to tell them, we can literally ground modern. African Americans and people of color in the narrative so that they can look to our national parks and say, wow, I've got ancestry there. I've got history, heritage, legacy. That's part of who I am as a person. And yes, I belong here. And not only do I belong here, I want to make sure that other people can be here and enjoy these places too. I think it was interesting, like in that, in that, um, the film in American Descent, I mean, like something I was a stand by, you touched on this at the start, was. Um, 20, 2006, I think, was the very first time that an African American had been on the top of Everest, and she was a woman. And, yes, Boom. yes, yeah, go, go <laughs> bow. Um, and and you mentioned on the phone that to this day, no African American male has actually stood on the top. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. And, and now, but I want to be clear. Now, there have been African men. Uh, there has been an American of Jamaican extraction, yeah. but there has not been an African-American man. And, I, and I'll define an African-American man or a black American um, as someone who is the product of the 
of the diaspora, post Civil War, post Jim Crow, post Civil Rights era. You know, someone who grew up as a native born American black person has never sent it to the son of the Everest, um, except for uh, my friend Sophia Dannenberg, um, who in 2006 became the first African American man or woman to make it to the summit of Everest. And, and that goal is still out there. But as you know, as an adventurer, you know, these kinds of, of excursions are really expensive to execute. You know, they require a lot of disposable income. They, they require, you know, free time to be able to take off, not only to train, but to be on the mountain for, for three months. You know, those are huge obstacles to, to overcome. And, you know, frankly, just in terms of how, you know, our socioeconomic system is, is built here in the U.S., there's not a whole lot of African Americans that have not only the interest, will, physical ability, and interest to climb Everest. There's, there's not that many that have the disposable income and leisure time to, to climb Everest. And these are among the many things that are preventing people of color from having a more direct and active role in things like modern mountaineering or, or general or adventuring. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing that, I guess, it's, It's amazing that there are still so many firsts in this. And I think that is one, I, let's bring up this topic of kind of just, um, we asked you the question, James, or actually Justin asked me the question, and I couldn't answer it just so that kind of people are on the board, and I think you just did. But well, It's a safe space, so I mean, we can have these conversations. Yeah, Justin asked me, is it more, you know, sensitive, inclusive, politically correct to say African American or black person or black American? And I was like... I actually don't know. Growing up, African-American was politically correct. But typically in my life, I kind of tried to not mention race. I tried to not make it an issue. I just tried to look at the person because I don't call myself a white American. I don't call myself a Dutch American. I'm just an American. So I typically have not addressed it in that way. However, given the re events of the last couple weeks and, and the societal I'm thinking maybe I should address it more because then I'm raising my voice to it. So I'm kind of caught in the middle. I'd love your viewpoint on that, James, given, you know, you're based in the States and, and obviously what's your viewpoint on that? Cause I don't want to step, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to step out and be seemed insensitive because it is such a big issue for me to be on the right side of. And I really care and I don't want to come across that I don't. So what's your right. thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think my thinking on this was defined by my friend and, um, and frankly, literary hero, uh, Eddie Harris. And Eddie Harris, in the, in the 80s, uh, wrote a book called uh, Mississippi Solo. He also wrote one of the very first articles on diversity for Outside Magazine, also back in the 80s. And as an African-American man, he paddled a canoe from Lake Itasca, Minnesota, down the Mississippi River, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And essentially, he was looking for racism, or he was looking for the black experience as a black man in the outdoors. And he's actually, since 30 years later, in 2015, did that trip again and uh, created a new film that he calls River to the Heart. And he was my guest uh, as a lecturer here at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we had a, a podcast interview you know, like this one, and he basically told me his take on what it means to be an African-American. Um, he's actually a person of color, a black man who lives in France. He's actually no longer, he's still an American citizen, but he chooses to live in Europe. But he describes himself not as an African American, but as a Black American, because he's not from Africa. Yeah, he's from America, you know. And it doesn't make sense for him to describe himself uh, as something that doesn't directly relate to his personal pedigree. Now, myself, he, many Black people in America, can certainly trace our ancestry back to the African continent. But you know, frankly, we've been in North America as long as you know any white person so why would we not describe ourselves as americans i'll make the distinction as black american because we really need to talk about these issues because you know i've often heard and i know that you have to people say well you know i don't see race i'm colorblind mm. well that's there's a problem with that because when you describe yourself as colorblind that means that you don't see what i go through as a person of color in this country, yeah. you know, so that you don't, you don't understand that 
um, you know, I'm typically followed in, in, in department stores to make sure I don't steal anything. You know, that I'm looked at with suspicion as potentially being a threat in public places, you know, even in remote wilderness areas, especially if I'm by myself with a single woman or with a single um, group of women, you know, I can you know, conceive of and perceive as threat. You know, and so I think that it's really important that when we see people, we see them as their entire selves. And part of their identity, part of my identity as a black American is, you know, the constant scrutiny that I'm put under. You know, and that's true to this very day. Now, I'm not prepared to suggest that I deserve any special consideration. I don't think that I should be, you know, given any more due trust than anybody else. But at the same time, though, I think that it's important that we recognize that a person of color in the United States, especially, um, you know, is treated differently than a white person in the United States. I mean, it's, it's just a fact. And to deny that fact, you know, I think it's not just naive. You know, in many ways, it's dangerous. You know, like if you take a look at what happened in you know, Brunswick, Georgia, back in February, an African-American man, Ahmaud Arbery, is running down a public street in broad daylight and is literally hunted down and murdered by two, three white men who believe that he didn't belong in this particular neighborhood. Okay? All things being equal, I mean, everything being equal, had that been me, the same, I, I would not be speaking to you now because I, I cannot imagine anything that might have done, might have happened differently, that would have had a better outcome were our positions reversed or if I was in his place instead of, instead of his. So I think that we really have to, to consider that, you know, an identity as a person of color in this country and, and in many places around the world, you know, we do ne we do necessarily have to have consideration for a person's identity as a person of color. Yeah. I think that's really one that brings tears to my eyes because, you know, I still am so proud of America. I love it. I haven't lived there in 14 years, <clears throat> but, you know, we, w we do hope to move back for a stint of time to be there. And, and the fact that that's still happening today, I think... Um, just like you said, it, it, we need to change it. So, you know, how do we start looking at people as their whole selves? And even in sustainability, I know that that's, you know, environmental protection and sustainability and living sustainably. You know, I've done a lot of work fighting for equality in the boardroom um, mm -hmm. and diversity in the boardroom. And, and the ultimate fact is that if you have that diversity, whether that's age, whether that's race, whether that's male, female, whether that's sexual gender, you get better business results because people have a differing view of, the environment and you only get better business because you have differences of opinion. You know, if, if everybody is the same age and the same color and the same gender and the same background, you are not going to lead your company in, um, in as, I guess, positive or even financially astute way because you do not have those, those that you might have blinders on to some um, areas that need to be focused. So I think if we take that into the outdoors, um, you know, this is not coming, that's not been my world for 15 years. And now coming into the outdoors, you know, I was aware that, that women are still fighting for this, their place. And I think, you know, watching your documentary and seeing that for the climbers in the documentary, it was so important for them to have their kids see them climbing, to have other people in their community say, well, she's doing it, I can do it, or he's doing it, I can do it. And what I also liked about the documentary is that there is diversity in age, in, mm -hmm. um, in male and female, um, in where they're from. And I thought that that was wonderful because yes, you're looking at it through a, a race lens for that climb, but you also can see it through an inclusivity lens. And I think this is an opportunity to be more inclusive, to change the dynamic, to protect our environment more. I mean, there was there was someone on the documentary, I forget his name, but he was saying, you know, there's going to be more, um, that, that there's going to be, help me with the more 
there's going to be sure. the, the minority is going to become the majority by 20 years. Yeah, the minor, even though that doesn't make sense, the minority is going to become the majority. And if they are not in the outdoors and they are not connected. connected and they do not love it, they do not feel included, they will not protect it. So here we are in the world. We're in a climate crisis. <laughs> we're in a race crisis. We're, you know, like where where do you see in your lens of having a broad experience where do you see this all coming together and being able to actually make change finally because we've been talking about all these things for a long time climate race everything do you think now is the time that things will really change or can change i think that, I think that now is the time that can change now whether or not it will remains to be seen and the only way it's going to change is if we are proactive and aggressive about making sure that it changes. And one of the things that has changed in my thinking since the film came out now over five years ago, yeah. you know, the expedition was seven years ago. The My personal thinking on it has changed quite a bit because, you know, I, I, as a person who's been in the outdoor industry for his entire professional career, I felt that it was really important that we kind of had a, a vision of outdoor recreation from the top down. You know, quite literally from the highest point in North America, you know, so that we can first identify that people of color do indeed do these things. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that was difficult in some of the audiences that we were showing the film to was that even that was too high. You know, the aspirational lens of, of something like a, a, a high mountain that's expensive and life-threatening and time-consuming to climb, couldn't we come up with a message that was a little bit closer to home? And so over the last couple of months and years, I've actually uh, developed a, a conversation around the connections of people in cities relative to the nature that's actually around them. You know, and specifically, that's related to things like access to fresh drinking water access to sustainable agriculture that's affordable, um, being able to have access to the open green space for, uh, for recreation, but also, you know, just for decompression. I mean, studies have shown that trees in urban neighborhoods actually have a calming effect um, that causes the reduction in crime. You know, and it also allows people to see themselves as part of the natural environment. And what's really remarkable is that if we can begin the conversation there, we can take it a minor step, step forward in a project that I call the Pathways Project, where I made a direct connection between urban rivers and the national forests that they typically find in their headwaters in. Mm -hmm. And so you take a look at a city like Atlanta. Um, it's one of the most densely populated urban cities in North America that, that has a very high percentage of people of color, specifically African Americans. The Chattahoochee River runs right through um, much of the, the biggest parts of, of, of Atlanta, um, as well as the, uh, the Flint River and a few of, of, of the other smaller tributaries. But every single one of those rivers have their origins at a tiny little spring off, just off the Appalachian Trail in the Chattahoochee National Forest about 150 miles away. So there's literally a direct molecular connection between the drinking water that comes out of people's taps in the most densely populated city in North America, one of the most densely populated cities in North America, and a national forest that is 150 miles away. And so I basically got a group of young people together and took them to the Chattahoochee River in town. We went on, on a short hike. We took a look at the scenic overlook, and we can see the proximity of nature to downtown Atlanta. And then the next day, we got in cars and buses, and we went to see the headwaters. And it's fascinating because, you know, the, the Chattahoochee River in Atlanta is huge. I mean, it's, it's as wide as, as um, you know, five uh, city freeways, barge traffic goes by, but the headwaters is a puddle about the size of a pie tin. And from that tiny little piece of, of, of water comes all of these different tributaries that ultimately become that the Chattahoochee River. And to be able to make a direct connection between the trail systems and the campgrounds and the, the, the um, areas of recreation that are two and a half hour drive away um, it's easily accessible for a, the, you know, the price of a, you know, a $5 
uh, park admission sticker for the day. You know, a family could have a beautiful recreation experience that's directly related to the place that they live. You know, and so when I stop and think about, you know, how we can close the adventure gap, a big part of that is creating current cultural wellness. How does the outdoors directly relate to my lived experience? You know, so if we can encourage people to walk, to eat well, to drink fresh water, to insist that they get time to live, work, and play in the outdoors in a meaningful way, that's ultimately how we can make these very positive connections with relatively disconnected communities that are actually infinitely more connected than we ever even realized. Yeah, I think that's so important. I mean, that connection to country is huge in Australia, I know, for the indigenous um, population as well. You know, they say you don't, it, it's, how, how are we supposed to know our connection to the people that are from this land if we do not connect to country? Um, that's right. huge. And I think, I think that's a really brilliant way to think about it. It's like, how do we connect within our own environments and our own places? And then how do we connect together? And then how do we connect out? And I think you were talking about, which I'd, I'd love to have you kind of share more broadly, the big O and the little O of um, outdoor that you were talking about before. Um, I thought that was really a, a really interesting frame to put on it. Can you kind of share with everybody what that is for you? Sure. Well, I mean, and frankly, you know, it's the big O outdoors is what Jonesy does. <laughs> you know, going out and crossing, you know, the, the South Pole and paddling the Tamsin Sea and doing these big outdoor adventures. I mean, they're amazing, they're exciting, they're inspiring, but they're absolutely inaccessible to the vast majority of people, even the people with money and, and disposable income. Little outdoors are the things that we do every day. I mean, the ability to quite literally walk out your front door and take a deep breath, you know, and to breathe fresh air, to be able to, you know, walk perhaps to work or to a nearby city park, you know, to be able to maybe go to a farmer's market, to have access to the fresh groceries, uh, to be able to prepare meals, to be able to, you know, recreate with your children. I mean, all of these things are nature. All these things are the outdoors. They're, they're not, you know, I mean, no one's ever going to write, you know, a, a, an adventure novel, you know, about my trip to the farmer's market, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, though, it is indeed a substantive, culturally relevant experience that is accessible to anybody who has the ability to decide that these things are important to them. As a society, I think that we need to do a better job of facilitating those little experiences. You know, that means being able to make sure that we allocate money for parks, that we, you know, create you know, neighborhoods that are indeed walkable, that we have, you know, um, um, traffic that is slowed down to a more human scale pace. You know, and I think that that's ultimately how we can create, you know, people who can get that small, little old adventure that will basically say, well, gee, what's on the other side of the town? You know, what's at the other end of this railroad track? And how far can I get? And the next thing you know, you've got people that are going for longer hikes. They're considering doing, you know, a three to four day backpacking trip. And that backpacking trip might turn into a three through hike of the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail or here in Wisconsin, um, the Ice Ridge National Scenic Trail. You know, and then suddenly those little O's become big O's. Mm -hmm. And more people start seeing themselves as part of the big world of the capital A adventure. Which... I've got to say that I prefer the, the little O, the little A, you know, the <laughs> small adventures, the micro adventures and the do little you? outs. I do because, you know, the, the big O's are so, I mean, even with a track record of having done so many things, there are so many barriers to it. And I look at that. And so if you're starting from scratch, oh, no. if you're starting from scratch you're, and if you're starting you're right, from you're the risk. I mean, who, I mean, who wants to do that necessarily? Yeah, I mean, it's it's what type three fun. It's it's some of this that stuff is, is is sadistic as well. I mean, you don't really want to do it. You don't even enjoy it when you get back. You just think you have. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. But the the little love is so important. And yeah. it's something that's fantastic for me recently. It's just been with children. You know, having kids and realizing that the right. the big O is is too hard with little people. And so sharing the little O so that they can maybe have their own big O's later. Um, yeah. yeah. I think I think that that, that James uh, an interesting thread I'd love to pull on is that both 
a solution to this problem, um, which we obviously still are facing, um, like we were years and years and years and for centuries and centuries, how do we change it is connection. Um, right. and, and you, you can finally see your place in this bigger world, you know? And I think that's a problem that we face as a, as a human, as humans at the moment in terms of how we treat right. our planet, how we treat each other. And I think, I think it's so exciting to be in this space in terms of, you know, the adventure gap, because adventure, it could, can be a solution to these broader human and societal issues that we are facing. I mean, right now you can see it's a problem because we are not all represented, um, but it could be one of the fastest pathways. I don't know. Do you think it could be that fast pathway to help us really make a change now and to, to put in the hard yards so that things will actually oh, change for our kids? And we won't be talking about this in 20 Absolutely. years. Absolutely. And, and my, you know, personally, my whole thing right now, too, is, you know, I, I mean, I've had plenty of really great experiences. I, I would look forward to having many, many more. But I also am very excited about helping to facilitate other people's experiences. Mm. You know, and I think that one of the best way that, ways that I can ensure that I will be able to have future adventures in national parks and other wild and scenic places is to make sure that other people have experiences of their own so that they will ultimately fight with me to protect them long term. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, I honestly feel that I can afford, you know, to, I mean, like during, you know, the COVID-19 lockdown, you know, I literally have been home longer than I have been at home for 20 years. I mean, I've, I've been traveling in one capacity or another for my entire professional life, and I've never spent more time at home. But frankly, I'm glad to some degree because I think that we kind of opened up the, um, the environment to get a break from humanity, yeah. you know, long enough to be able to... Um, you know, to, you know, maybe heal a little bit, to rebuild. I mean, if you take a look at, you know, the air quality in major cities in industrialized countries around the world, um, the environment is starting to snap back without human beings out there. Now, now that the lockdowns are starting to lift and as we're starting to think about going outside, personally, I don't want that eager to go out, like, like right away. I kind of want to let other people you know, have an opportunity to, you know, spread their wings and stretch their legs and figure out what their interest in the outdoors can be. And through my writing and through conversations like this and, um, you know, through other projects that I'm working on, I'm trying to make sure that when people go outside, you know, they do so with the intention of becoming better people when they come out. Yeah. And you might help to facilitate that, you know, in many ways, simply by just not being there. I'm happy to do that, you know, and to perhaps minimize my own impact so that other people can have more positive experiences on their own. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I do think that, because I struggle with that too, you know, COVID has been very challenging, but to see what it's done for the environment, for an environmentalist, there is something heartwarming. And to also know that you know, hopefully we can put the argument to bed that humans don't have a significant impact on the planet, you know, from a carbon perspective or right. other. We're, we're, we're seeing the rubber band snap back into place. Yes, I mean, so we can do we, it. We've it's positive. Stretched and we've stressed, and we, we, we see now, you know, what our maximal footprint can do. Yep. Now that we've seen what our minimal footprint can do, I think less and less is the case that that human beings aren't having a dramatic impact on the environment. And especially when we're talking about introducing more urban people to the outdoors, you know, I think that many people are starting to recognize that that, you know, maybe driving less, you know, is is in order. We've just been driving less for the last 30, 30 days to um, to sixty days in the last few months. Mm -hmm. You know, and also, how just, well like, like, just like you said, how important is that walk? Sorry. Well, no, I, I, I think I that, that part about. of it, too, is that, that you know, a lot of companies are starting to think about maybe we don't need to have people commute into work. Maybe they can tell telecommute. You know, I mean, hell, you, we're all talking across yeah. two, three continents. <laughs> I mean, um, to, and, and here we are having a, a fabulous conversation without getting on an airplane, without getting a car, you know, without polluting the environment. You know, 
how hard can that be? Maybe we should get in the habit of doing things like this more often. Uh, yeah. I, I am terrified, I have to admit, though, the idea of revenge pollution. The, the idea that, you know, all, you know, everyone's like, the economy's been hit hard. Australia is saying that, or different countries around the world. So when we get back, we got to go hard and we got to push. And when China mobilizes like that, and it's, it's for me, it's, it's a fight with our system, this growth focused economy that we have. It's just that there's got to be a bit of a different way. And I think. I, I think we're at a precipice where, you know, if the COVID pandemic was probably, I suppose, a little bit, well, this sounds terrible to say, it was a little bit worse in the sense. What was, it was just I a warning. Get more people on board. Because I think only when humanity actually gets hurt and hurts quite hard, that they'll, they'll go, oh, geez, you know, right. everyone has to take this seriously. And that's from the top echelon, you know, who normally don't give a SHIT, uh, right down to the, the Joe public who feels it every single day. So well, I think people want to change. I mean, that's why yeah. people are rioting in the street. Yeah. You know, we, we want change. Right. We're, we were writing for climate. We're writing for right. inclusion. We're writing for, you know, sexuality rights. Like people want change. So we have had to slow down and look at ourselves, you know, do the tough work, tough work and slow down and, and be able to look at ourselves in the mirror. And it's not pretty in many ways. So how do we use, right. I guess, in your viewpoint, how do we use this time to, you know, you hear new normal a lot and people have different viewpoints about what that means. You know, what would you like to see this new mm. normal to be? What would you like to see the future to really look like if you could, you know, if you could have your way? Right. Well, I mean, I think more than anything else, I, would, I really would like to see more people see themselves in those that are suffering most because the COVID crisis racially motivated violence perpetrated by law enforcement, you know, the, uh, not, not just the disparities of access to nature, but disparities in access to things like healthcare, affordable housing, um, you know, uh, government, government and bank assistance to start a small business are disproportionately negatively impacting communities of color. You know, and so what I would really like to see is for people who have privilege you know, who aren't negatively impacted by these things to the same degree, to look at their brothers and sisters, their neighbors in their communities and say, you know, I can't be successful as long as you're suffering. You know, what I would really like to see is for people to say, wow, you know, I understand now after this crisis is starting to, you know, dissipate that, you know, my lifestyle, because I desperately need, you know, strawberries in February, is directly dependent upon you know poor migrant laborers you know who are being paid slave wages in order to support my lifestyle you know at that point i'm more than happy to start paying more for my vegetables and only get them in season hmm. you know i want to make sure that that laborers are actually getting paid a living wage and that they're not you know spending um, you know, more than 80% in some cases on housing and transportation for the money that they're, um, that they're earning while, you know, working on, on, on farmsteads. You know, I want us to be able to, to you know, look at a, at a poor neighborhood, you know, and say, wow, we really need to reinvest in schools there. <laughs> we need to reinvest in businesses. We need to reinvest in um, things like infrastructure. We need to, you know, you know we need, a board, we need a, to fix the windows. We need to to fill in the potholes, you know, we need to, you know, repair the storefronts. You know, now that we've burned everything down in the riots, I think that now's a good chance to start rebuilding. And as we rebuild, I'm really hoping that we'll be able to rebuild in such a way that everyone will be included. Because, I mean, right now, we're literally being able to see, you know, the, the slate wiped clean. I don't advocate for violence. I don't advocate for destruction of, of property. But since it has indeed happened, and we are now obligated to rebuild. The question now is how will we rebuild? And what will that rebuild look like? And who, whose lives are we going to most directly impact? Because when I stop and think about the number of people in the United States, at least, who, I, who did not get, were, who were not able to take advantage of the stimulus that, that was so um, you know, aggressively laud lauded as the best thing that's ever happened. Well, most of the people who got stimulus checks were people who didn't need them, myself included. Yeah. You know, I didn't lose really yeah. a paycheck. I mean, yeah, I lost a couple of speaking gigs, but my wife and I both stayed gainfully employed throughout the pandemic. Okay, 
but we also got um, you know, combined checks from based on our last um, our last tax statement of twenty four hundred dollars. We didn't need that money. You know, in fact, that money is basically just going to go right back to the federal government when I pay my taxes later this this year. Now that I've got a a, a 30, uh, 60 day extension on my tax bill for the year. Yeah. But there's there's families out there who don't know where they're going to sleep tonight. They don't know what they're going to eat. They don't know um, how they're going to pay their medical bills. They're not. They don't know how they're going to be able to um, buy medication. You know. And, and sadly, as I'm, as I'm thinking about this, uh, you know, and I, I'm suddenly inclined to challenge myself, you know, how can I reinvest that $2,400 in, 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 in my community? And I think that we should all be encouraged to do things like that. I was just thinking that. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I think that, well, two things. I'm with you, and maybe we could talk, because I got the check. Um, granted, our income has you, gone. You didn't even know you were going to get the check. Well, I mean, I, as an American citizen, I pay taxes every year because that's what you have to do. And I got the check, which I had mixed feelings about because I know that there are so many other people that need it, even though, you know, we, our income went to zero having Justin speaking and I just had a baby. So I haven't been working. Um, that It's been a scary time, but, it, but we, I still have a warm house to sleep in. I still have fresh food. Um, you know, in Australia, there was a toilet paper pandemic, and that's the biggest of our issues, which is an issue. Um, you know, and it's and it makes me think how, yeah, I think how do I want to invest um, my resources going back in? And I think from a passion perspective, both environment, sustainability, and adventure are two big things. How do we bring? You know, there's um, uh, food deserts, and how do we bring? Just like you said, connections important. How do we reconnect people to local food? Um, to empower them to grow it themselves, to give them space to drink clean water. Um, I think those are both, those are all really important, you know, to walk under trees, you know, the biophilic example mm -hmm. of, you know, an urban landscape is huge in terms of, you know, when we're trapped in COVID, you realized how important that 30 minute walk outside was. I don't know what your restrictions were over there, but in Australia, you could go outside basically for exercise. So you would see so many people outside in every green space. And all of a sudden, a golf course looked ridiculous for how much green space is there for such a small use when people need to be exposed to nature. So I, I really right. hope that I think that's that's a beautiful way to look at, you know, a symbolic, the, this, our cities are burning. I mean, our, they are really burning, but a symbolic would be how can we rise from the ashes, I think is a really beautiful way to frame it. So thank you for that thought. I wanted to just say as well, you mentioned a couple of things about trying to sort of like redistribute sort of, you know, wealth and income and making sure there's kind of more equality. I mean, with America in particular, the whole idea of or notion of possibly being labeled socialist seems to be such a taboo thing. I mean... This is a big I, conversation. I, 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 no, I mean, they shouldn't be going into this, but I mean, like, it, it, essentially we're trying, to, we're trying to take care of everybody. So, I mean, why is it Well, so look, healthcare crazy? works really well here. Being an American in Australia, I do not worry about my health care, and that doesn't matter if I have a job or not, or if I'm poor or not. I have this conversation with my parents all the time, you know, and it's... But, I, don't, I don't understand. Like, I, like, still, I talk to you sure. about it. I, I'm, I'm talking to James about it. Like, I don't understand why there's so much negativity towards it when it, fundamentally, like, you know... Cap towards more inclusivity. Yeah. Yeah. Inclusivity. yeah. Is, is it because they want to keep the people right. down? Or well, I'm saying just... Well, I think in my, just in my personal opinion, people who complain most about socialism don't even know what it means. You know, what, what true so socialism means, just like they don't really understand what capitalism is. For example, in a proper capitalist society, there should not be such a thing as corporate welfare. Yeah, you know, you bailout. should not be able to get bailed out of a multi-billion dollar company at, at taxpayer expense. You know, um, so that if you want to talk about socialism, that to me is 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 the height of socialism, and I think that there's a um, a cultural disconnect between people who believe that um, everyone should work hard and, and draw a paycheck and shouldn't have to be on on the government dole. Well, guess what? This month we were all on the government dole. Everyone got it. Everyone you know who got a check is on the government dole. You know, and so and no one gave that money back. That, that I'm aware of, and, and if they did, hopefully, and I know many people did, you know, reinvested in their communities, you know, and so when we're talking about what it means to be a socialist, um, to me, what I really, I mean, I don't, I don't want people to have to worry, of, worry so much about 
paying a medical bill, that they don't get medical help until their condition is so bad that they have to get medical help um, in order to save their lives, only to have the cost of that medical assistance, assistance be infinitely more expensive than if they had just gone to the doctor when they got their first symptom. Yeah. Okay. You know, we have, and, and that's one of the reasons why the COVID crisis has hit the United States so badly, because our, our medical system infrastructure is so poor in that we have this horrible mentality of, oh, I'll wait until, you know, it gets really bad and then go to the doctor. You know, when you wait, when you wait that long, you, you not only run the risk of compromising your own health, um, but you also in, exponentially negatively in impact um your outcome yeah you know like for example you know some of you might know that there is a uh, a disproportionate rate of colon cancer in the african-american community and i was i took part in a, in a study a couple of years ago um on preemptive color ca colon cancer screenings and you know being a lay person not a medical professional i but as a journalist i had plenty of questions and so part of the, the system was to actually have a conversation with the doctor and so i'm asking the doctor so what is it about the african-american or the black genome that makes me more susceptible to colon cancer and he said well there's nothing genetically that makes you predisposed to having colon cancer. But socially and culturally, African-Americans are less likely to visit a doctor to get a diagnosis early enough to prevent the condition from getting much worse. Mm -hmm. And that blew my mind, okay, because it has nothing to do with my genetics, but it has everything to do with how I'm trained socially to be distrustful of the medical system, um, to be um, more inclined um, to seek, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of a suck it up attitude and just grin it and, and bear it with the pain. The, the problem is that by the time African American men get diagnosed, it's way too late for an effective treatment. But their white counterparts who get diagnosed um, with regular doctor visits much earlier have the ability to have that cancer um, identified and diagnosed much sooner so that their outcomes are infinitely better. I mean, it's the systematic yeah. issue. You know, yeah. once you start pulling the thread, it just keeps going and going and going. I mean, in Australia, it's the same oh. thing. I think it was 40% of, um, when we walked through the outback, we were like, look, we are not experts in indigenous health or needs. What do you need? Like what we went and talked to a couple organizations on the ground run by indigenous people. And they said that they have 40% um, of their elderly population has kidney failure. Um, not because it is genetic in the sense of their genetics with European systems, food, um, you know, they were taken off their land and then they were given, you know, very processed food. It doesn't sit well, alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the issue is, is that right. their elderly uh, population are dying because they cannot get dialysis treatment on country because they have to go into a city. They would rather die than go into a city and lose their country yet they're forced to therefore their grandkids don't get to hear the stories of culture and if you lose that generation they don't get the, the, their stories are not written down in the same way that western culture is so that was a big thing so there, there's a whole thing that we supported called the purple house anyone in australia look it up um it's an amazing organization that helps mobile dialysis treatment go out on country to help keep indigenous populations on country and in community. So, I mean, it is it is one of those systematic issues that, that varies depending on where you live and who you are, um, no matter where right. it is. I mean, one of the reasons why COVID disproportionately has impacted the Navajo and indigenous people here in the United States for basically the exact same reason. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I recognize time. I feel like I could chat with you forever. <laughs> but I think it, to, to kind of pull it together in terms of, you know, this, hopefully this opportunity that we're facing, a lot of things are broken. That gives us the opportunity to hopefully fix a couple things. I think, you know, looking local and connecting, um, understanding where our systems come and how we impact and 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 taking care of people that are less fortunate, I think are really important ways to start. Um, how do we facilitate uh, common experiences in the outdoors, I think is another one to sit on. You know, how do we, 
how do we bring people with us, but respectfully, so that we don't ruin natural spaces like we've ruined city spaces, I think is an important one. Um, and I guess any other things that, that people listening today could say, James, what can I do this week? You know, anything else that, that you were like, just start here. Um, examples that are always really helpful for people not wondering, wondering how, want to help, but they don't know how. Sure. You know, I think that the, the, the best first thing you can do is just go for a walk. You know, and by walking, I think that we have an opportunity to not only inventory ourselves in terms of, of how we're feeling. You know, we have the and hangings. Can we take a deep breath? You know, um, do we do we sweat too much? Do you are our clothes too tight, etc. But we also have an opportunity to inventory our neighborhood. You know, to get an idea to you know what's going on. I mean, um, are there, is there garbage that needs to be picked up? Are there um, areas that um, are being excessively impacted by uh, high rates of traffic? You know, are my neighbors able to walk comfortably? I mean, and how are they doing? You know, being able to you know even in the COVID crisis where we're all wearing masks and nobody is you know encouraged to. Um, to hug or shake hands or whatever, you know, you can always still make eye contact and smile, you know, and that in many ways is a connection that you can make with a human being that, you know, is completely incapable of transferring disease, but every bit is capable as transferring human emotion. I like to say that a smile is a hug your face makes. <laughs> I like that. Also, with, with yeah, yeah. go ahead. Well, just, just being able to, you know, have that positive interaction with human beings, you know, is hopefully, you know, a way to start seeing the common humanity to make you want to do other things. You know, support people's local businesses, I mean, especially if they are in agriculture. You know, being able to support people's crafts or their skills and, you know, their, um, their ability to uh, provide for you services that uh, enables them through you your money to reinvest in your neighborhoods so that you can ultimately benefit. You know, and again, from this can ultimately come the disposable income and leisure time that's necessary for all outdoor recreation activities, including going for a walk, going for a hike, going for a long paddle across the Thames and Sea one day, climbing to the summit of Denali, maybe one day, you know, being the first African American man to summit Everest. I mean, this is where it all begins. I mean, it quite literally starts with taking a step outside and going for a walk. Well, I think it's amazing that the the, the need for diversity is, is huge. I mean, I personally, I, I never, this is going to sound very strange, I don't feel like I belong in the outdoor community. Like, I, I, I don't. Um, and, and that's not because it's necessarily my background. I mean, I'm half Chinese, Indonesian, half Australian. But it's, it's more there is just that an element of toxic masculinity that's kind of there. And it just, there's this, I'm going to say a dick measuring kind of ego thing that goes on in the outdoors. And I just, I just, I don't, it just doesn't gel right with me. And so the, the more diverse the groups are, you, the more you eliminate that sort of elitism that happens. And, and there are certain sports that are even more so. I think in climbing and mountaineering, the elitism is even more apparent. Um, I think at least trekking, you know, walking, bushwalking is, is coming down a lot quicker. Um, I think it's that, that he or she can't be what he or she can't see. And I think that was why I loved right. your documentary so much. Because although I'm not, you know, I am a white American, I still saw myself in the women climbing. The, in the younger, you know, I'm not young anymore. I pretend I'm 30, <laughs> 20, but I'm 40. But, um, but, you know, I could see myself in the women. Or also I could see myself in, they had never done it. And they were honest about uh, you know, the challenges that they were facing without this arrogance. So I thought that just because the diversity in the film, not only in color, but in that they were, they had a different viewpoint to share. I want to thank you because I thought, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. So I, I knew, I didn't know about that documentary. You know, I hadn't seen it at BAMP for the other film festivals. So um, I wish that I would have, because I think it's such a beautiful documentary to see. So thank you for creating that story so that he and she can be what he and she can see, I think is really powerful. I've got a question. Well, thank you. And I refuse to take full credit for it. You know, we had a lot of really great support um, from our um, our filmmakers, um, Andy Atkins and George Potter, plus 
um, the entire um, team that was actually on the mountain doing the physical climbing, and of course the National Outdoor Leadership School that you know provided the funding and technical support to make it happen. So um, I will always give them full credit. I just have the privilege to, to write and tell the story. That's and and I have to say this might not be naive. Um, expeditions are expensive, like we were t- talking about. You know going through the outback was a less expensive one, but it was still freaking expensive. And we had to spend a lot of savings and we had to really say, like we asked if we were on the dole out there and I was like, do you know how expensive an expedition like this is to do? Um, I noticed that you, that film Mm. was funded through Kickstarter and thousands of people that went through Kickstarter, which back in the day that was significant. Was it sponsored by large, you know, outdoor brands? Like, you know, should it have been, could it be? What's your viewpoint on that? How do we get, how do we break that barrier of financial? I mean, if that's the start, how do we break that barrier of financial, um, um, you know, how do we break the well, financial barrier well, of getting into uh, the we had, So, I mean, initially we had, you know, I mean, Noel's literally turning their entire marketing budget for a year over to this project. Awesome. You know, and that included being able to um, train all the athletes for up to 18 months. You know, um, the, the Kickstarter um, funding came just for the film, you know, and and that was almost half again as much as we spent on the expedition itself to be able to create the film that, you know, included being able to get a film crew in Alaska, you know, in order to be on the mountain to quite literally have a parallel expedition of filmmakers to shoot, you know, the climbers as they're making their way up the mountain. Um, you know, but we also had a lot of really great support from the North Face, um, from REI, um, you know, and, but also a lot of, of smaller private donors that were, you know, kind enough to support the effort by, you know, kicking in their money. But, you know, but I can tell you that, you know, um, I don't think you should ever let money be, an, you know, an obstacle to the things that you're trying to do. And so I'll tell you just a, a real amazing brief story. Um, I actually was supposed to be on the summit team, and basically I should have been on camera on the expedition like everybody else. But during training, I was diagnosed with osteoarthritis, and I had to have both my hips replaced. Oh. And um, the surgery took place four months before the expedition was supposed to start. And so I lost my spot on the team. There's no way that I was going to you know, be able to do the climb. Um, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to be able to tell the story. And so, frankly, you know, as I'm you know, going through rehabilitation, my doctor um, tells my, the, the medical school um, and the, the University of Wisconsin um, Department of, of um, Osteology that I was planning on doing this expedition and I couldn't do it. And so then they went to the manufacturer of my prosthetic hips and they told them their story and my story and um, they gave me a grant um, to be able to write my book and to spend three months in Alaska to do the research for it. You know, and had I had that, had I not had my book, my history place, and not gone on the climb, I never would have been able to write the, the, the story, produce the film, um, or to even be sitting here telling you the story with two functionally good, functional ifs and the ability to have more adventures later on. You know, but it just goes to show I always believe that for every step forward you take towards your goal, Providence takes two steps back towards you. You know, so I'm... I, I don't think that it's a good idea to wait for the money to come. I don't think it's a good idea to, to you know, try to convince other people that you're worth investing in. I think that it's critically important that everyone invest in themselves, you know, and try really hard to do whatever they can to move heaven and earth, you know, to fulfill your dreams, even if it means. And I don't ever recommend this because it's just not financially sound. But you got to put, you know, all those, you know ropes and carabiners and backpacks on a credit card for 30 days, do it. Uh-huh. You know, just make sure that you've got, a, got a, a good repayment plan to be able to, uh, to, uh, to pay that money back. But bottom line, you know, I'm not going to say that money is irrelevant, but it shouldn't be the primary obstacle that prevents people from doing the things that they want to do. I mean, I can tell you that many of my best experiences as a quote-unquote adventurer has been as a tag-along, being able to trade other skills. You know, for example, I have been, I, I uh, did a trip to um, to climb in Africa um, as the team medic. 
you know, so I get a you know, discounted rate on, on all of my tra- transportation and all of my, my, um, my lodging, et cetera, because I was the guy who had enough um, emergency medical training to be the person that was going to um, bandage all the, uh, the bruised knees and, and sprained ankles and apply back team to, um, you know, to cuts and bruises, et cetera. You know, and that was a skill that I was able to tra- transfer. Sometimes I know people who work their way through expeditions as the team cook. You know, Mm -hmm. as a photographer, you know, I've got many experiences, you know, going on on really fabulous, fabulous adventures. And it has, you know, and I'm, you know, it's really funny. I mean, I, I, I've never considered myself um, privileged. I mean, certainly I consider myself privileged, but I've never considered myself poor. I make like no money because I spend it all on, on, on stuff. I'm just glad that I have a gainfully employed wife. You know, who has an <laughs> infinite amount of patience to uh, you know let me go away and do things. But bottom line, though, is that a lot of what I do has less to do with the money, has everything to do with the intention and the des- the desire to, you know, come up with some knuckleheaded plan to do the things that are important to me and that I hope to share with other people. To, to, to anyone out there that is actually thinking about getting into the outdoors, I mean, that's one thing you should know. If you get hooked, you will have a very big storage closet, very big garage full of just kit and gear because there's so many different things to do. Um, well, maybe we can get that rented. We, we yeah, should we... do it. <laughs> uh, now, so we had just had a couple of questions like that just pop up. But one thing was, you know, how do people check out the uh, an American Ascent? What's the best way to do that? There's a couple of people that are asking about that. Can you put a link up? Yeah, well, currently it is available um, on download download for in iTunes. Yeah. Um, so you can basically just go to under iTunes and you can rent it for three ninety nine. You can buy it for nine dollars. Okay. Um, it was these days it's cheaper than a um, a, a ticket uh, for one to the movies. So we'll yeah, it's link really up. affordable. Um, you can also I mean if if and that's typically what I do for my, my students. I so don't bother reading the book, just watch the movie. If you want to read the book, you can basically get it at my website at um, either joychirproject.com or theadventuregap.com. Um, you'll be able to find um, links to how you can uh, purchase the book there. Fantastic. So cool. that's joytripproject.com or adventuregap. And we'll, we'll put these in, into the follow up notes as well. Yeah, definitely. And look, we've got probably Great. one final question because I'm conscious all the time. In your opinion, who do you think should be in the hot seat? Who would you want to hear from? Who's an adventure thinking thinker that you'd want to hear on this show? Or that you need their story? You think their story Ooh. should be shared? Mm. Wow, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I really love Eddie Harris, if you can get him. Um, he's very accessible. He's, a, he's an incredible guy. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think, you know, some of the... Um, Actually, one of our expedition climbers, uh, Stephen Schilb, uh, who's the oldest member of Expeditions Valley at the time, he was 50, 56 years old. Um, now he's pushing 60 and still has uh, plans to be the first African American man on the summit of Everest. Ah, cool. Um, let's see. We'd love to connect with him. That's a rough question. We actually have yeah, good friends sure. that guide thinking, Everest. Um, so that could be a connection. And, uh, um, and Sophia Dannenberg, you know, the first African American summit Everest. I mean, uh, she is, um, you know, definitely a great person to talk to you about her personal story. Do you know her? Um, I'd love you to know, and, and her. I, oh, I, um, she and I are friends. So I'd be more than happy to give her your contact information and vice versa. Amazing. Um, or at least I'll ask her first, make sure that it's cool with her. Yeah. But um, I'm, I would imagine that she might be interested in talking to you. That'd be amazing if she if she could give us if we would love to I would love to hear more about that story and I'm surprised I haven't heard about. It. Well, here, here's the thing about about uh, Sophia though she's incredibly humble, mm. um, and and that's probably one of the reasons why few, so few people have heard of her. Mm. She doesn't talk about herself, you know. And as a um, as a non professional climber, I mean, she's a she's a a excellent amateur climber. As, and frankly, she's as good a climber as any professional that I know. But she she has a, a, a full time job. She doesn't need to promote herself as a climber. Yeah. Um, that's the only thing that I would caution to you on with Sophia. She might be hard to, to get her to talk uh, about herself as I just did for an hour and a half. Well, maybe her theme could be you know adventure thinking on humility, and she could talk about that. That could be a really interesting. Just riffing. Indeed. Yeah, but I, she, yours. She should be more. Well I mean, honestly, I really think. I really think. Um, this has been an absolute treat. 
No, I really, really, really appreciate this. And no, like, I, I want to find an excuse to drag you out to Australia. Yeah. I think we... you have to come. <laughs> I, I don't have a trust me. We'll more than happy, happily get on a plane to, to Perth or Sydney or wherever you can, can pick me up in the airport. I'll totally be there. Oh, 100%. We'll yeah, pick we'll... you up wherever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you end up in Perth and we live in Sydney, we'll come pick you up still. Right? Yeah, that's, exactly. Because you've got to stop through Sydney first. But we're going to Denali too. Us, uh, we're uh, locked in for that with you. Yes. Yep. All you have to do is publicly yeah, and, say it and, and it'll happen. And you come down and fly fishing Wisconsin with me. So, yes. Cool. Yes. And you can come spearfishing, come spearfishing in Australia with me. That's a that's an interesting kettle of fish. I think it's one of the most um, wow, immersive outdoor experiences you can be involved in when you're underwater and you're part of the food chain and you're not at the top. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's, 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 that's so exciting! No, no, totally count me, and I would, I would absolutely love that. And I gotta say, it's it's a shame that we're seeing each other over the video screen. I would love to hang out now with you, and you know, once the um the the COVID crisis lifts up, I would look forward to giving you both a hug. I I agree, and thank you, literally, from just um for sharing, for entertaining us last night with the story of Denali, and for coming on. It's so nice to meet you, and thank you for sharing stories that need to be heard, and thank you for um just making this day so enjoyable. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, we normally end it with a video, but this week uh, we were kind of having madcap tech issues. So uh, it's going to be sayonara and we will be back on regular time next week, which is Wednesday, Australia at 12 p.m. To so everyone out there, thank you so much. James, thank you. Lauren, you're thank amazing. You. And I will, we will see you next time. Thank you.